Welcome everybody, good to, good to see you this morning. Um, today we're on part two of our series, Rethinking the Church, and I believe that as we're beginning this new year, that God wants to impart to his people, to his church, a, a courageous spirit, a courageous spirit. And I believe that it would bring great joy to the heart of God. If we as the people of God would courageously seek him and, and, and ask him what he would desire in our church and in our lives. Now last week we looked at the, a few examples of, of God's miracle working power in the early followers of Christ. And I asked you to consider what happened to the, to the power of God in the church. We saw all these great and, and wonderful things, these, these, these miracles. And so, we, so what, what happened to that power? The Apostle Paul told us, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. It's, it's God's incomparably great power for us who believe. It's God's power in us to empower us to minister to others, to, to make a difference in the world. And it's not just me. It's, it's not just a select few. It's us. It's the church, the body of Christ. And so the question I, I'd like to ask this morning is are, are we living out are we, are we fully living out the prophetic role that God has called for us as, as his body on earth? You know, today in, the, in America, there's there so many churches like ours that are, that are blessed with wonderful people and, and, and you know, such comfortable places to meet. And I thank God for the atmosphere of worship, the, the wonderful music and, and the, the social connectedness that we experience today and all that stuff. But I wonder sometimes if we might have lost our focus. As we gather together, we've become so good at creating comfortable, uplifting, and even pleasurable environments. But has that begun to overshadow the central things? Is it possible that our focus on Jesus' death and resurrection has become unclear as, as we coordinate the music, the sermon, and the fellowship times to make sure that, that we're all being entertained? And that as we have visitors, that they feel comfortable, that they feel, feel welcome. Are we, are we worshiping God in spirit and in truth? Are we courageously speaking the truth? And are we leaving room for God's word to transform us into the image of Christ? Today, as we're rethinking the church, we need to remember that, that church isn't about what you or I can do. But it's about what Christ has done. All the wonderful relationships, the, the sermons and music aren't, aren't entertainment. They're, they're merely vehicles which are intended to bring us into God's presence. When we gather together in, in Jesus' name, God's presence is here. So God's presence should be that central thing, a central part of our worship. It's, it's the powerful presence of God that transforms us. It's, it's meant to bring light to our eyes, illuminating our minds and showing us the difference between the, the, the wheat and the weeds in our lives. And that's, that's why God's word is called a refining fire. He's a refining fire. And it's, it's because it purifies. But it's also called a sword. And it's both, both of these are tools that are used to separate things that d divide the pure from the impure. And yet these aren't things that we naturally seek. You know, we long for comfort and pleasure in our lives, in, in our jobs, in our homes, but the, the Bible challenges us to do things that are th really just kind of uncomfortable, things that we naturally resist. And I believe God is calling us to a new level of courage today, to set aside comfort and popularity, to proclaim fearlessly and courageously the cross of Jesus Christ and to proclaim the power of his resurrection. Like the Apostle Paul, you may remember his boldness writing to the church in Corinth. This was a church that he started. He, he planted this church. He, he loved these people, and yet no sooner had he left that church to go plant another one 
Then false teachers came into the church and began to discredit his teaching. And so in 2 Corinthians, in this letter, Paul countered their accusations against him, and he actually boasted a little bit. He, he said it wasn't really what I, what I wanted to do. I don't really want to go here, but you know, he, he gave his list of credentials, a, a list that would silence any doubt that to his apostolic authority. And in chapter 11, he reestablishes his credibility by listing these trials that he'd, he'd courageously endured in his service for Christ, for his church, and for his people, something that these false teachers would never do. And so in verse 23, he says, are, are they servants of Christ? Are these false teachers, are they servants of Christ? And then he says, well, now I'm, I'm, I'm out of my mind. Now, I'm, now I'm, I'm going out of my comfort zone. You know, this, this isn't really the way I am. But he says, let me boast a little bit. He says, I am more. I have worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have gone without food. I've been cold and naked, and beside everything else, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. So he says all these things. I have done to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, to share the good news that, that there, there is salvation in Jesus Christ. That heaven's available to those who would believe. And God proved it by raising Jesus from the grave. He said, all these things I've, I've done for others for the church, so people could know, so people could come into heaven. In contrast, here in, the, in, in our American church culture, we have things so easy. It's, it's so natural to become sidetracked and to, to lose sight of our priorities. You know, our, our American church culture has, has, you know, fancy stage lighting with flashing lights, smoke machines, choreographed worship teams, and and, and messages that comfort instead of challenging. But Paul runs down this list of trials that he's faced, and he concludes saying, I face the daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. And so I wonder what it would look like if, if we could look at our problems and consider them in light of those who are facing a Christless eternity. Might, might the shadow of eternity increase our concern for one another, and not just for our church, but our, our neighbors and for those we have yet met? Consider Paul's situation when he wrote the letter to the Philippians. He was under house arrest for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in spite of the fact that he was facing an uncertain future and even the possibility of execution, even though he was in the, in the middle of a very significant trial, he said in Philippians chapter 1, I want you to know that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Jesus Christ. Be because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. I've been praying I've been praying that we as a church may be stirred in the deepest part of our souls to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. 
I pray that we would be more concerned about the presence of God than the perfect sermon outline, than more about the presence of God than, than every song being perfectly tuned and everyone's cup brimming over with fresh Starbucks coffee. I pray that we'd be less concerned about our temporal problems and more concerned about, about how our lives would impact the eternal kingdom of God. Paul says, because of my chains, others have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. My prayer is that you would, you would courageously crush under your feet whatever it is that you've been struggling with, whatever has caused fear in your life, and whatever may have derailed you from achieving God's purposes. And that that very thing will propel you to step out fearlessly. You see, Jesus came so that we could have life and have it to the full. But our spiritual enemy came to, to steal, kill, and destroy. The Bible tells us that the, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And that his greatest weapon is the lies that he uses to create fear and insecurity in our lives, paralyzing us and keeping us from being effective for the kingdom of God. But today, I proclaim in Jesus' name that together we're standing firm against the devil's schemes and we're becoming a courageous and fearless church. Amen? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. We're going to step out of faith in 2017 and we're going to do something great and wonderful for God. And so here's what I'd like for you to do today. I want you to consider what your greatest fear is. What is your greatest fear? What's that one thing that you fear more than anything else in 2016? Now, maybe you might say, I, feel, I fear failure, I fear conflict, or I fear rejection, or I feel like I'll never measure up no matter how hard I try. I don't feel like I'll ever be good enough. And I'll, I'll be honest for you, you know, for me, that's mine. That's my fear. My, my whole life, I can remember feeling as if no matter how hard I tried, I could never measure up to my, my, my younger sisters. You know, they, they were the bookworms. They were the ones that were always reading, always learning. And I was the one you know, that was you know, pulling C's, you know, and, and there's you know, straight A's. And you know, so I could never measure up. It didn't matter what, what, I, what I did, I was never good enough. Um, and so even now, even now, decades later, Almost half a century later, funny to say that, isn't it? Even now, sometimes I still wonder if I have what it takes, especially when it comes to being successful as a father or in a business or in a ministry. And so sometimes I still wrestle with self-doubts. But here's what we need to understand. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So whatever it is that you fear, it's your spiritual enemy that's, that's trying to talk you out of following God's plan by telling you that you can't do it, that you'll never measure up, and if you try, you're going to fail. And so what you need to know and understand is that God is not behind that. That God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but he wants to give you a spirit of courage. Amen. God wants to give you a spirit of courage using that very thing that once held you back as a spiritual springboard to achieve your greatest potential. Now, the Old Testament tells us about this guy named Benaniah. And he, he was a guy that if, if you're not paying attention when you're reading the Bible, that you're going to miss him. It, it's, he's one of those kind of guys. But really, Ben and I, when you, when you look at who he is, he was one of King David's mighty men, one of the top five soldiers in Israel. He was a general of the Israeli army. And, and so he was the best of the best. Ben and I was honored because he was courageous. And his story is found in 2 Samuel chapter 23, where the Bible says that Ben and I, the son of Jehida, was a, was a valiant fighter from Kabzeel who performed great exploits. He struck down two of Moab's best men. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian, although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. 
Benaniah went in against him with a club. He snatched his spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Now, I love that kind of story. But, you know, as you read that, there's a little sentence there that's so easy to miss if you're not paying attention. The end of verse 20, and it's so easy to read right past this. You know, it's like, oh, and by the way, Benaniah, this mighty warrior, followed this lion down into a pit on a snowy day. Oh, by the way. In other words, <clears throat> this, this isn't the, the best strategy. This, this wasn't the best day to be wrestling with a lion. You know, the lions have these great big claws and bigger teeth. <laughs> you know, they, they, they can crush your head with one bite. And so here's, here's Ben and I, and he jumps into this pit with this lion wearing moccasins or maybe some sort of sandal. You know, this is before they had the Nike high tops with the grippers, you know. And so this is like crazy courageous. You know, it's, it's snowy and slippery in there, and, and uh, that's the kind of guy that Ben and I was. He's the kind of guy who goes after a lion, who follows them into a pit, knowing that only one of them's coming out. That's courageous. You see, people of faith, people of courage, people like Benaniah will, will chase after lions. They, they won't let their fear stop them from doing what God has called them to do. And so here, here, here's what I'd like you to do, to think about that greatest fear. Think about that lion that you need to chase. Today we're talking about being courageous. We're talking about living by faith. No more excuses of, of why you can't do this or that. No more regrets. And, and some of you, God is, is calling you to push through your greatest fear. Some of you, there's a ministry. There's a, a divine burden inside of you. God's birthing something so big that you just can't stand it. You know it and you can feel it. And so, some of you, you've got, a, you've got a heart for a certain part of the world and, and God is sending you. Some of you, God's calling you to volunteer your gifts right here in Emmitsburg. But there's, there's always excuses, isn't there? There's always excuses as to why you haven't done it yet. There's this, this inner struggle, this turmoil, this fear keeping you from chasing that lion. You, you see the need, the, the opportunities there. You, you know you could do it. And yet there's excuse after excuse as to why you don't. What is God calling you to do that the fear has paralyzed you from pursuing? Today, I want to show you two important qualities of, of a courageous church. Two thoughts, I pray, that would inspire and encourage you to, to serve with passion. The first thing is, courageous people see their God as bigger than their fears. They see their God as bigger than their fears. You see, the challenge for many of us is that we're looking at the lion when we should be looking at God. Some of you, you've allowed yourself to be focused on, on what you're afraid of. And, and, and because of that, you're, you've allowed your fears to grow. And they, they've, they've become overwhelming. Instead of taking your, your attention and redirecting your attention on that one who can overcome your fears. You see, when we stop making excuses and start looking at the source of our strength, all of a sudden things change. What seemed impossible now becomes possible. You see, courageous people don't look at the lions. They look at their God. I love the example of Daniel. You know, Daniel was another one of those guys who, who went face to face with a lion. You know, he, he confronted that lion face to face. The Bible tells us about this in Daniel chapter 6. It was at that time when, when, when the king, under the compulsion of his advisors, he kind of got manipulated into it, but he, he, he ended up having to throw his friend Daniel to the lions. The next morning he went to check on Daniel, and the Bible says that in, there in verse, uh, verse 20 that, that when he, King Darius, came to the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel. And he shut the mouth of the lions 
they have not hurt me. Now, what's interesting there is that, that King Darius asked Daniel about his God. In other words, what he's saying is, I don't know him. He's, he's not my God. But what can your God do? What can your God do? And I think there are so many people who profess to believe in God, yet when they think of God, he, he's somebody else's God and not their own God. You know, maybe, maybe their mother's God or their, their friend's God, but it's, it's impersonal. It's someone else's God. But if, if we can get to that place where we would shift from what can your God do to here's what my God can do, suddenly everything changes. This morning, how big is your God? How big is your God? Is he big enough to shut the mouth of lions? Is he big enough to crush your fears? Well, my God is. My God is. You see, my God is the Alpha and the Omega. My God is the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. My God is everywhere. He's, he's all-knowing and all-powerful. My, my God, with my God, all things are possible. I don't know how big your God is. But my God raises the dead. My God, he opens blind eyes and hears the, he'll hear, he heals deaf ears. That's how big my God is. My God is so good that when mankind was separated from him by our sinfulness, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, who came born of a virgin to live the perfect and sinless life, who, who would shed his innocent blood for my sin. My God shed his blood for my sin. And because Jesus died, my God raised him from the dead. My God rolled away that stone from his tomb so that we could know that we serve a risen Savior. Amen? He didn't roll away that stone to let him out. He rolled away the stone to let us in. That's how good my God is. As a matter of fact, let me, let me tell you what my God did for me. My God took the most rebellious and selfish guy and revealed himself to me. He delivered me from my sin and, and saved me. He called me to himself one morning. I knelt down. I asked for his forgiveness, and, and I stood up forever changed. My, my God transformed me. He made me into a new creation. My God forgave me of my sins. He healed me. He delivered me from addictions. My God gave me a new heart, a, a new passion, and a new life. That's who my God is. And I'll tell you, when I'm overwhelmed, my God is my peace. When I'm weak, he's my strength. When I'm hurting, he's my comfort. When I'm lost, he's my way. When I'm thirsty, he's my living water. When I'm alone, he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. His power is real and he's living inside of me, and that's who my God is. My God said that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. How big is your God? And let me just tell you if, you, if you, if you know my God, you won't let that lion talk you out of what God has for you to do. If you know my God, you won't let that lion speak those, those lies into your ears to talk you out of what God wants you to do, what God says that you can do. You'll be courageous. You won't, you won't look at the lions, but you'll look to God who says that all things are possible. You see, courageous people know their God is bigger than their fears. And the second thing is that courageous people don't consider the limitations. They seize the opportunities. They seize the opportunities. When you're facing that lion and your problems seem insurmountable, you need to change your perspective. You need, you need, to, you need to put on some faith. Hebrews chapter 11 describes it this way, without faith it's impossible to please God. 
courageous people know that their God is bigger than any problem they'll ever face. And they know that God has the ability to turn any problem into an opportunity for their good and for his glory. The Apostle Paul shared this perspective in Philippians chapter 1, saying that I, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so being courageous in the face of fear is simply a matter of perspective. Our problems, our fears, whatever that lion is that you're facing, they're, they're not all powerful, but our God is. Our God is all-powerful, and so every problem you face is an opportunity for God to accomplish something incredible in your life. Paul recognized this, and he committed his life to helping people grow in the knowledge and the grace of Jesus Christ. And so what that did was when he was in prison, prison wasn't an obstacle. When he was in prison, he wasn't limited by his chains. It was simply an opportunity it was an opportunity for him to write letters to the churches that he couldn't visit. Now, nobody likes living through a crisis or a time like that, but you know, given a choice, we'd miss, you know, we, we'd always take the less painful path. But we need to understand that the goal of faith is not the elimination of risk. You see, there's no such thing as a risk-free faith. When you're living by faith, the, the risk increases and the security decreases. And so when, when God called us to start Christ Community Church, it was something that made me feel insecure because it increased the risk. It decreased my security. But, but God called me to chase that lion. We, we couldn't consider the limitations. But we had to courageously seize the opportunities. And God gave me the courage to jump into that pit. Today, God is going to call some of you to increase the risk. To stop considering your limitations, but to live by faith and to seize the opportunity. You know, what would happen if we, if we together became a courageous church? You know, what, what, if, what if we were united around Christ? What if, what if we believed we were really one body? What if we believed that our God was so big that we could actually stand together and make a difference? What, what if we believed that? What if we believed that we could chase that lion together? Some of you, God's given you a vision of something, and yet you have all the reasons why you can't. Why, why you're not going to, or you, you shouldn't, or you might not. But I, I guarantee you that, that ben Benaiah was afraid. You see, that's part of the thrill. Because when you're afraid, there's that rush of adrenaline. You know, it's like, it's like shooting a semi-automatic gun. You, know, you, get, that, you get that thrill, that, that, that excitement of, 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 of adrenaline. And, and, you know, it's part of the thrill. So when Ben and I have felt, felt that, fear when he when he jumped into that pit when he faced that Egyptian he felt that rush of adrenaline and that, that's the way that's the way that we need to be if, if, if that's you right now I want you to I want you if, if you have that thing that that fear I want, you to, I want you to feel that fear and do it anyway. Do it anyway. Seize that opportunity. Take that step of faith. Feel the fear and look to God who says all things are possible with me. What, what is God calling you to do today? You see, there's not one of us in here that doesn't have God's calling on your life. Not one of us. Every one of us has been called by God. He has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. His, his greatest desire is to see you in heaven for eternity. He longs for that. He died for that. What is God calling you to do today? I encourage you to, to step out of fear and to step into faith. 
to step out of all the reasons why you can't, to step into faith in God who says you can because with God all things are possible. Walk not by sight, but we, we walk by faith. So take that step of faith. Do, do what you can do and trust God to do what you can't do. You do the believable, let him do the unbelievable in your life. You do the ordinary and let him do the extraordinary. Be courageous. Let me encourage you for a moment as we close. You are an overcomer. You're empowered by the spirit of the living God. You were planted at this moment in history because it was at this time that God could best use you to make a difference. You are here not by accident. So be courageous and step into what God has called you to do. Step out of yourself and into his anointing. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of a power of love and of a sound mind. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we ask that, that you would speak into our lives today, that you would draw us closer to yourself, closer to our source of strength, and that we would rely upon you for power, that, that you would be our God, that, that, that it, would, it, would, it wouldn't be somebody else's God, but that you would be our God. It would be a personal faith. God, you know there are some of us here that are facing fears, and, and honestly, it's, it's been paralyzing. God, there are some of us who, who, who know that this is all, it's just a lie, and we need, we need, we need to chase the, this lion. We need to chase it. It's really clear right now. I, I pray that you would give that person, you would give that one the courage to do what you've put before them. Give them the courage to take that step into faith. And those of you this morning who would say, you're, you're, you're right, I, I've been afraid, I, I've, I've been hesitant, I've been, I've been cautious, I've been living by sight and not by faith. Today I want to take this step forward in faith. If that's you today, would you raise your hands right now? All, all of you respond to God right now if God's speaking to you. Just lift your hands high. Just lift your hands if God's speaking to you today. If this is you, if you've been, if you've been afraid, if you haven't done what God's called you to do, all right, God bless you. Let's, let's pray. Father God, I, I do thank you for those that you're speaking to through this message. I thank you that you are a sovereign God. You know the call you've placed on each person. And I, and I pray today that their, their mind would be renewed with the truth. That they would realize that they, they, they don't have a spirit of fear. But they have a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. God, I pray that they would have the courage to chase that vision, to chase that lion. And they would push through that fear, stepping into the potential that you have for them. And so, God, I, I pray that, that today ministries would be born. I pray today that there would be businesses that would be born. I pray today that books would be born. I pray that there would be generations that would be different because a father or a mother had the courage to step through their fear into faith. God, I pray for, for those who who come to Christ because your people would step through the fear of rejection and have the courage to share the goodness of your son Jesus Christ with those who don't know him. I, I pray that, that we would not know you as someone else's God or hear about someone else's God, but that we would know you as our God and that you would give us the courage and the faith to do what you've called us to do. As we continue to pray, there, there are some of you that, that God brought you here for this specific reason. As you look at your life, you might say, I, you know, I, I do, I feel really inadequate. I feel like I'm not good enough. How, how could God ever use someone like me? How could God love someone like me that, you know, that's done the things that I've done? And I just want to say to you directly, if that's you, that you're, you're right. You're a mess. And so am I. I am too. You're a sinner and so is everyone else has ever lived. If you, if you feel the weight and the burden of your sin, it's because we're separated from God by our sin. If you feel guilty, maybe, maybe even for something you did last night, let me just tell you this, you're, you're here for a divine purpose. You're, you're here to meet with the, 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 the God that wants to forgive you, the God that loves you. 
that cares about you and wants to spend eternity with you. You're here because God brought you here, and he's reaching out to you. He wants to show you the love of his son, Jesus Christ. You see, when God became flesh, Jesus shed his blood and died for you so you could be forgiven, so that you could be transformed and be made totally new. That's why you're here today, and you know it. If you're feeling drawn to God right now, you may, you, you may still feel unworthy. You may wonder, what do I do? Well, you just call on him, and when you do, I promise you, when you call on the name of Jesus, the same thing will happen to you that happened to me. All of your sins will be forgiven, you'll be transformed, you'll become brand new, and you'll be filled with the Spirit of God, and you'll be empowered to please God on earth. And so those of you who say, that's me, if you can identify with what I've just been saying, if you, if, you, if you say, I believe in the Son of God, I give my life to you, take my life and save me, if that's you, would you lift your hands high right now? Just lift them up and say, that's my prayer. God bless you all. Th those of you lifting your hands right now, would you just pray aloud with me? Just, just, let's just pray together. Heavenly Father, save me from my sins. Make me brand new. I know I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I give my life completely to you. Jesus, be my king. Be first in my life. Be the leader of my life. I thank you for this new life. Now I give you mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If we, if we have our worship team come up.